thank you for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Matthew Ludwig. My research mentor this summer was Dr. Cleves, and I was also working directly a lot of the time with Sudan. And I'm going to give you a talk on uh, the in silico exploration of the prebiotic synthesis of diverse nucleoside analogues. So it's a widely held belief that in order to investigate the origin of life on Earth, we must investigate first how the first self-replicating systems with the ability to store genetic information arose. One of the main ideas pertaining to this is the RNA world hypothesis, which content contends that the originally the sole mechanism of genetic information storage was RNA. And further, it was involved in the catalysis of reactions enabling its own synthesis and thus formed the first or one of the first self-replicating systems. RNA is a polymer, the monomer unit of which is the ribonucleoside shown here on the left, an example of a class of molecule called a nucleoside, which specifically has ribose encircled in red as its sugar base. Recently, it has become apparent that alternative nucleoside analogues could have been more readily synthesized under the prebiotic earth conditions we're considering four billion years ago and so and very chaotic and, and completely different to the pristine laboratory conditions we're more familiar with in organic chemistry. These nucleoside analogues, a general example of which is shown here on the right, all have the same basic structure, a sugar backbone with two reaction sites where they can react with other nucleosides in order to polymerize, and a site where they can react with a nuclear base, one of ATGC or AUGC we're all familiar with as the building blocks of the universal genetic code. So the question to consider is, are alternative nucleoside analogues more promising as candidates for the basis of the first self-replicating systems than ribonucleosides and RNA because of their simpler or more robust pro prebiotic synthesis? Elucidating the molecular basis of the first self-replicating systems should help us to understand the all-important transition oh, sorry, from free-floating molecules in pools of water on the Earth's surface about four billion years ago to the first self-replicating systems taking the form of biopolymers and then through some currently unknown mechanism to the first living organisms, the transitions in the development of life. So what work has been done in this field thus far? Well, firstly, Dr. Cleves has generated uh, a library of nucleoside analogues, with nucleosides again being, gen being defined by their ability to polymerize and react with a nuclear base, necessitating the three aforementioned reaction sites. Moreover, chemical reaction networks, or CRNs, have been generated by the 2020 Cleves YSP team, simulating prebiotic earth chemistry and what molecules could have formed from plausibly available molecules such as ammonia. These CRNs, an example of which for a glucose network is shown here, again produced by that 2020 Cleves team, these CRNs comprise of nodes, which represent molecules, as shown in the diagram, and edges, the lines between them, which in this case represent reactions into converting them. To build up a CRN, the reaction rules are defined and then executed on a few starting or seed molecules. This process is repeated iteratively, generation by generation, to build up the network. The 2020 Cleves team investigated five different sets of chemistry through five different networks, each with a different set of starting seed molecules. Formose ammonia, formose, glucose ammonia, glucose, and pyruvic acid. So we built upon the work of that 2020 Cleves team by investigating the intersection between the two aforementioned data sets, the library of nucleoside analogues and the products of those CRNs produced by the 2020 Cleves team simulating prebiotic earth chemistry. We then identified synthetic pathways that could be traced back from identified matched nucleoside analogues from the seed molecules of a network, tracing back through the network using the RELs or relationship files associated with each network, encoding all the reactions that occur between molecules of the network. So how do we go about doing this? Well, firstly, we produced a matching script, which identified which products of each CRN were found in the nucleoside analog library. This script converted all molecules into their inchy key representation, a code which encodes characteristics of a molecule, including its molecular formula and bond pattern. We then found matches between each CRN output and the nucleoside analog library by, by considering each product of a CRN in turn, and then iterating through the entire nucleoside analog library and comparing their respective inchy key representations to identify whether or not they were matching. So no match, no match, these two are matching. We then characterized the data sets of matched nucleoside analogues through the calculation of descriptors, properties of the molecules such as molecular weight and formula, polar surface area, and van der Waals volume. 
We then identified synthetic pathways for target match nucleoside analogues and determined how thermodynamically favorable these reaction pathways were. In order to do this, we used tree structures, such as the one shown here, to represent a pathway traced back from a target match to the seed molecules of a network. Tree structures are used generally in data science to represent a hierarchy, with nodes, shown here by green squares, in this case representing molecules, and branches, shown by the arrows between them, in this case representing reactions into converting them. At this stage, we assigned placeholder values for the Gibbs free energy change of the reactions of each network because the tool we wished to use to generate thermodynamic data was not functioning. In order to determine the thermodynamic favorability of a, a reaction pathway, we summed the value of the Gibbs free energy of the reactions comprising it, and then looked at that path energy value. The more negative that value is, the more spontaneous the overall pathway and the more thermodynamically favorable it is. We took two approaches to this, to this process of retrosynthesis. The first was a best guess approach, where at each juncture, where a reaction, where a molecule could be produced through multiple different reactions, the more thermodynamically favorable pathway was taken with the more negative value of Gibbs free energy. So at this first juncture here, the lower pathway is taken with a more negative value of Gibbs free energy, as shown by the purple pathway. And then again, at this juncture, the lower pathway is again taken because it has a more negative value of Gibbs free energy change and thus is more thermodynamically favorable. And then to determine the total path energy of this reaction pathway, we sum the value for the reactions comprising it, giving us a path energy of minus 12. Additionally, we took a complete retrosynthesis approach, generated tracing back every possible pathway from a target nucleoside analog match to the seed molecules of the network. At each juncture, where a molecule could have been produced in multiple different ways, the tree was copied, and each copy traced back a different path to the seed molecules of the network. As this figure shows, three different pathways could be traced back from a ta this target to the seed molecules of the network, each with a different path energy. This also illustrates the deficiency of the best guess model, which for the same values of Gibbs free energy yielded this bottom pathway C, which as you can see, in fact, has the least negative value for total path energy, and thus is the least spontaneous and the least thermodynamically favorable. So what did we find out? Well, we discovered a large intersection does in fact exist between the library of nucleoside analogues and the products of the CRNs simulating prebiotic earth conditions. The fewest matches were found for the foremost CRN, 3,404 representing 14.5% of the network, and the most for gluc the glucose ammonia network, 6,057 representing 23.2% of the network. This figure is a plot of the cumulative number of matches for the pro between the products of a CRN and the nucleoside analog library against generation number, which is the number of times that the reaction rules have been applied iteratively to a certain network in order to build it up. As you can see in this figure, the number of matches for each CRN increases with generation number. And moreover, the number of matches yielded by each CRN relative to the others changes as generation number increases. Moreover, we discovered that some of the identified match nucleoside analogues are present in existing reference databases. Hits were found between the match data set yielded by a particular CRN with three reference databases, the human metabolome database, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, and the E. coli metabolome database. This, this figure specifically plots the cumulative number of hits between the matches data set yielded from the pyruvic acid CRN specifically with those three databases, but it exemplifies what's true for all five networks, that the number of hits between the matches data set for a CRN increases with all three reference databases with generation, generation number while still representing a small proportion of the total matches data set as you can see bearing in mind that this is a, a graph on a with a logarithmic scale so the next step in this research is to identify from our nucleoside analog matches data sets the most promising candidates for the basis of the first self-replicating system the first step to doing to this is to generate actual thermodynamic data using semi-empirical group contributions methods using a tool called Equilibriator. Generating actual thermodynamic data will allow us to assess the thermodynamic favorability of the retrosynthetic pathways that we've produced. This, in addition to further analysis of the descriptor data that we've given, will enable us to screen the matched nucleoside analog data sets in order to determine the most promising candidates for the basis of the first self-replicating systems. 
Moreover, we need to use tools such as Neo4j to investigate whether autocatalytic cycles are present within any of the networks that we're considering, and if any of them yield promising candidate nucleoside analog matches. Autocatalytic cycles, such as the one shown in this figure, with a continual input of feeder molecules in energy are self-sustaining, because products of certain reactions of the cycle catalyze other reactions of the cycle. If autocatalytic cycles were discovered to exist in a CRN and produce a nuclear, match nucleoside analog, then that would increase the likelihood that that analog could have accumulated under prebiotic earth conditions in sufficient concentration for spontaneous self-assembly into a biopolymer, a key step in the development of the first self-replicating systems, and thus this would increase the favorability of that nucleoside analog as a candidate for the basis of the first such systems. Finally, once we've identified the most promising candidate nucleoside analog matches and the most thermodynamically favorable pathways for their synthesis, we can test in a lab whether these thus far theoretical synthetic pathways can be recreated experimentally. Further work in this area will hopefully elucidate the origins of the first self-replicating genetic information storing systems. This will in turn contribute to solving one of the great outstanding questions in science, which is how did life arise on Earth? And can it be recreated experimentally? Thank you for listening. If you've got any questions, please address them to me now. Oh, great job, Matthew. Um, I have a question right away. So we, you know, we might, might have had more than one origin on Earth for life. And also, do you think this kind of work could actually help us discover that there's many possible pathways to an origin of life, to an, to an autocatalytic cycle that could lead to life? So I think... I think the particularly the work that Dr. Cleaves did um, generating the live nucleoside analog shows that although the basis of life that we see on Earth, either all, all of it either being primarily DNA based but also RNA based, is those two options only represent a very small proportion of the total chemical space of what's possible chemically. Um, so work like this will help us to identify whether. Uh, specific characteristics were the reason why RNA and DNA became the sole genetic information storage mechanisms, or whether it's purely as, as a result of chance that life took that pathway, or whether it's just a, a, an evolutionary quirk, I guess. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? I see Sanjoy has his hand up. Matthew, this is a very interesting presentation. Thank you again. Um, in determining your most efficient path, uh, from the hierarchy, you're using thermodynamic favorability to determine that path. Uh, that thermodynamic favorability is temperature dependent. And so I'm wondering how sensitive is path determination to temperature? That's something that needs further consideration because uh, obviously we can we can take a stab at what we think the prebiotic um, what we think the prebiotic uh, surface temperature is from simulation and also through the fact that the, the, the temperature um, ranges that life tolerates is, is bounded, so we can guess at the surface temperature. As for how temperature dependent the thermodynamic favorability of those pathways is, um, that's definitely something that requires further research. I see Sid has a question. Oh, go ahead, Sid. Uh, so uh, it's more of a comment to Sanjay's question about uh, temperature dependence. So the, the tool we have, Equilibrator, works currently, since it's a semi-empirical method that can be run on your computer and not requires any HPC or clusters or something, it runs at 25 degrees Celsius, which I believe is a is an ambient temperature for biochemical reactions. Since nucleoside analog are biochemical in nature, it, it works well. But if you are looking at RNA world or, or hot spring hypotheses, yes, you would have to vary the temperature and then you would have to model these molecules on a HPC cluster using quantum chemistry theories, which currently we, we never use because of the computational challenges of, of these libraries. So equilibrator works at 25 degrees Celsius and they have just set it at the temperature. I thought so, thank you. Um, but if, if delta G is used to trace a pathway, um, changing a variable name might not require the use of an HPC cluster. Um, you know, I don't understand the details of the theory. Nonetheless, it's very provocative work and very interesting. And Ayush, I see your hand is up as well. If we can make it rather quick, we have about a minute left. Yeah, uh, so my question, um, uh, Matt, is uh, perhaps a bit more on the computational aspect. Uh, you mentioned uh, that 
Can you go back to the uh, slide where you mentioned that uh, tracing the purple path, which was perhaps uh, initially found to be the somewhat dynamically um, had the smallest uh, uh, delta G, but then you, you found that there were other pathways that had minus 14 or minus 20. Uh, why did this turn out to be the case? Um, is this because uh, initially you tried a greedy, the, the purple path is what you get when you try to run a greedy algorithm and the other paths were discovered when you run combinatorially all possibilities. Yeah, that's exactly it. So if you, if you just see quickly here, if the, the best guess algorithm, which yields this plot and pathway, if you look at this first juncture, that would have you following this pathway, uh, taking this, 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 sorry, this juncture, this uh, pathway, lower pathway. And if you can see, I mean, I've artificially made up the numbers to show this example, but the, the, the most negative values are found at this upper branch. And if you're following the best guess algorithm, you're going to follow this lower pathway. So that shows the quirk of the fact that if you're tracing backwards and you force the you force the the stepping algorithm to to take the the most thermodynamically favorable option at every juncture, then you won't necessarily end up with the 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 most thermodynamically favorable pathway. It's sort of it's it's not a, a, an exact analogy, but it's almost like you're tending towards a local minimum rather than the global minimum of the system. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thank you so much.